Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Declan decided he wanted to say hello this morning. <laughs> when I'm trying to sit down, he's jumping up on me today. Uh, I just want to say, brothers and Christ, I hope everything is going okay, and I pray that everything is going okay with you. Um, that you're staying in God's Word every day, you're staying in prayer every day, and you're doing your best to live for the Lord every day, no matter what. I'm hearing stories that brethren are getting distracted by the world, Mainly, uh, you got brethren in ministry that are getting you distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble as if we're going to go through it when we're not going to go through it. Make sure you're looking for that blessed hope and you're living your life preparing for the judgment seat of Christ, the day when we will be judged, our works will be judged. But that being said, we're going to get back into the series of Acknowledge Him in All Thy Ways, Aaron, Part 2. And I'm sorry, but you're going to get down. Okay. And I wanted to start, it's going to be a long study, but I wanted to start with a hymn regardless. Regardless, I want to start with the hymn. So the hymn I want to start with is, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. So if you want to pause and look up the hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, I'll put it there. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word. Just to rest upon His promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I've learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that He is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, trust to trust His cleansing blood, and in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Why did you choose this one, Philip, Brother Philip? Acknowledge Him in all thy ways. Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct thy paths. Amen. And we're supposed to live a life of Christ and let Jesus Christ shine through us by the light we're living. We talked about putting on the whole armor of light. You're putting on Jesus just from sin and self to cease. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? He's made into us wisdom, righteousness, righteousness, uh, Sanctification, redemption, sanctification. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. It's a good hymn, Brothers Jesus Christ. It's a good hymn. Uh -huh. So, once again, I pray everything's going great with you, Brothers Jesus Christ, and let's get started. It's going to be a long study. Started out with like three or four pages, and then ended up seven pages of notes. So, we're going to turn to the, to the story in Numbers of Aaron. And I'm going to keep the book here, but you can pause and always turn to all the scriptures that we'll be going to, because we're going to be going all over the Bible. We're going to be going all over the Bible. But got to do the intro, like we always do. Okay? So Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust the Lord 
With all thine heart and lean not on thine understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Acknowledge Webster's 1828 dictionary. Okay, this is not the final authority. This is the final authority. I said I was talking to a brother in Christ, and I typed in the word "made," and it comes up with "noun" and "earth form" because we're looking up how we were made in His image, and we're trying to look up the word "made," and this doesn't always have the right answer. I can't think of the word even now. I still can't think of the word, but I had to, God at the time gave me the answer, and I typed in a different word that meant the same thing as "made." And we found all the definitions, and it kept saying that word, and then it would reference the scriptures, but the word that the scripture uses is made, M-A-D-E. Not, oh, make. Thank you, Lord. When you typed in the word make, oops, new Declan go. then you get it, you know, <laughs> uh, to form of materials, get you over there now. To form of materials, sorry about that, brothers and sisters. To form materials, to fashion, to mold, and to shape, to cause to exist in a different form as a distinct thing. And then it goes an example of Exodus 32, 1 says, He fashioned it with a grading tool, and after he had made it a molten calf. Made? You just said make. We're doing the definition of make. So in order to find the definition of made, you gotta go under make for the Bible. And then it'll give you all these references and give you the right definitions of what made means. But if you just type in made, it just comes up as um, a noun, an earthworm. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the definition of made. It's like, what? What? So you can get this book from, uh, what is it, Bible Baptist Bookstore. Okay. Uh, that's where I got mine. You can probably get it elsewhere too, but I got mine from the Bible Baptist Bookstore. So without getting too distracted by that, but I just wanted to point out, this is not the final authority. This makes mistakes. There's times that there's definitions in here that don't line up with the word, the definition of the words the Bible use, like the Bible definition of words, and whatnot. So it's okay to use this from time to time, but make sure you, it lines up with the Bible. Okay? Acknowledge this lines up with the Bible. To own or notice with particular regard. To own or notice. Does, remember the Bible says you're bought with a price, you're not your own. You're to acknowledge the Lord in all thy ways. Why? Because you're bought with a price, you're not your own. Does God own every aspect of your life? Is He in every aspect of your life? You notice Him. Hey Lord, is this right? Should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? When you start getting into sin, do you notice that the Lord's right there next to you watching you do it? Acknowledge Him in all thy ways. Okay. To own or to know with particular regard. In other words, to make the Lord and His way the foundation of all thy ways. Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar. Remember what I've always said? Rule number one, God's word is always right. Rule number two, if Philip Newton is wrong, refer to rule number one. God's word is always right. This is the final authority, brothers of Christ. Not this. If I line up with this, it's because this is right. If I fail the Lord, it's because this man right here is failing. Not this. This is always right. Let God be true and every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightst be justified in thy sayings, and mightst overcome when thou art judged. Psalms 33.11 it says, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generation. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. God's way is always the right way. So what gets in the way of acknowledging the Lord in all your ways? We'll be continuing a series of studies showing great men in the Bible where they failed to trust the Lord and acknowledge him, acknowledge the Lord, and what got in the way of doing it. And right now we're on acknowledge him in all thy ways, Aaron part two. Aaron part two. Okay. It's going to be a long study. We're going to be doing scripture with scripture, so I hope you like Bible studies. I don't want to get off on it too much, but I've been noticing on YouTube and other video platforms that some ministries are becoming talk shows, uh, gossip shows, reaction shows, and Brothers of Christ. It's like the brethren are starting to not really get into Bible studies that much anymore, or not care for Bible studies. I love Bible studies. That's what we do here. So hopefully you love a Bible study and you're willing to take time to uh, 
listen. It might take several times. Uh, it might take time to go through multiple part studies, but it's worth it to stay in the Word of the Lord. Once a week, you should be going through at least an hour to two hour Bible study once a week, every day. But as Christ, you should be starting your day with the Word and ending your day with the Word. You should be starting your day with prayer and the Word of God and praying throughout the whole day. Pray without ceasing. Okay. So turn to Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to get into to acknowledge Him in all thy ways, Aaron, part 2. There's going to be three parts to Aaron. <laughs> he made some mistakes where he didn't acknowledge the Lord and trust the Lord. So Numbers 12, 1. We've got 12, 1 right here. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, we're not going to get into the big debate about an Ethiopian woman versus an African woman. They always try to make her out to be an It's an Ethiopian woman. Okay? Um, but I'd like to say it's a whole other discussion. I don't want to get distracted by that. Verse 2. And they said, here's the point, we're going to get to this Bible study. They said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Okay. First, who is Miriam? Turn to Exodus 15.20. Always keep your hands there for numbers. It's going to be a while before we get back to it, though. And I will admit, it's going to be a lot while before we get back to it. But who is Miriam? Exodus 15.20. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went after her, with timbrels and with dance, and Miriam answered them, say, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now this is taking place after the Exodus. The Jewish people are coming out of Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea. They're crossing it. Then Pharaoh and his soldiers decide in chariots, we're going to go after them. And the, the waters come back in and they drown Pharaoh and the army. Okay. Now, women are prophetess, not prophets. I just want to make a big strong point of this. There's a lot of women, uh, especially in the world and everything, it's just they're trying to be prophets. Okay? Well, women are prophets. They're just called prophetess because that's the woman's way of saying prophet. No, it isn't. Prophetess is a separate office than a prophet. A prophetess, prophetess merely proclaims the wonderful works of the Lord. We have uh, Miriam here proclaiming the wonderful works that God had just done. Destroyed Pharaoh and the army. Okay? And saved the Jewish people. Also, you'll see that the women went with her. Up here it says, She took him with hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dance. And Miriam answered, Them! When she says, sing unto the Lord, she's talking just to the women, not the men. You also see the women, when she says, sing ye to the Lord, she's talking to the women only, not men. In other words, a prophetess is someone who proclaims the wonderful works of the Lord, and it's not a man and woman thing, a group thing, where we're doing it in front of, like it's a whole group thing. No, nope, it was just to the women. Okay? Just got to throw that out there. But what was Miriam? She was a prophetess. God said, okay, I would like you to be a prophetess, but stay within the boundaries that I set for you as a prophetess. Today you have women not, that think they're prophetess, but they're actually acting like prophets. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get into too much, but I believe Miriam was suffering from uh, that woman Jezebel. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that, Miriam and Aaron, if you turn to 1 Samuel 15, 23, they were all, both suffering from rebellion against God. They both started getting prideful and started rebelling against God. 15.23 for rebe 1 Samuel 15.23 For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. Now God was giving his word directly to Moses, and we'll see this. Moses was a man of God that really close where he could talk to him face to face. Aaron's the high priest. That was the office that God set for him. That's the boundaries that God set for Aaron. Miriam was a prophetess. God set the boundary for Miriam, a prophetess. 
God has boundaries for us, brothers and sisters. Christ, he's got boundaries for men and women when it comes to physical day-to-day -day living. There's boundaries between men and women, and they're not to cross. There's boundaries in ministry. Some parts of ministry is just for men. Some parts of ministry can be just for women, like prophetess. And they overlap a little bit when it comes to ministry of reconciliation, uh, reading the Word every day, so a prayer. There's some things that overlap, but there's still distinction. There's some things that are just for men, and there's some things that are just for women. In this case, the prophetess was just for a woman. High priest was just for Aaron, the man of God that would speak all the words of the Lord to the people. That was Moses. Okay. Now, I can get into it, and I did in my notes, but I'm going to skip that. I don't want to get into Miriam as much, but that Jezebel spirit, uh, Revelation 2.20, 2, if you want to pause and turn there, Revelation 2.20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. Now, elder women are to teach the younger women good things, and the Bible lists those good things off. It's day-to-day -day living. It's not, let me open the scriptures and expound the scriptures to you. It's day-to-day -day living. Okay, how to love your wife, a husband. How to obey your husband. How to be a keeper at home. How to raise your children in the admonition of the Lord. How to have a meek and quiet spirit. How to be chaste. How to be virtuous. The elder women are teaching the young women how they're supposed to live day-to-day. Day-to-day living. Okay, how they're supposed to be. Um... But notice there it says to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Fornication, you're worshiping false gods. You're eating food sacrificed unto false gods. Now, fornication, what did we just read in 1 Samuel 15, 23? For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity, sin, you're sinning against God, and idolatry. When you rebel against God, you're trying to elevate yourself up to God's status. You're trying to elevate yourself to God's status. In Genesis chapter 3, we read about the whole thing about Adam and Eve and Eve being deceived. And what was she deceived with? Genesis 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said... The number one rebellion we see today in the world of professing Christians, they're, they're rebelling against Yea hath God said. And when they rebel against Yea hath God said, they don't want to do things God's way. They won't follow the true plan of salvation. They won't come to God broken, true biblical repentance, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save them, throwing the old man at the foot of the cross, giving their life to Jesus Christ at the cross so that the new man is bought with a price. He's not their own. He belongs to God. You start trusting God with all your heart. His way is the right way. You trust Him with what's going on in the world. You don't get distracted by the world. A lot of the brethren are getting distracted by the world. As if you're, a lot of the brethren are getting distracted into looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. What is wrong with you, brother and sister Christ? We're not supposed to be looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. And we're supposed to be preparing for the, for the day of Christ. The day of redemption where we get to, we go up and we get judged at the judgment seat of Christ. You're supposed to be working towards that judgment seat of Christ, not getting distracted and fearful about the time of Jacob's trouble or what's going on in the world. Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. Oh, did God really mean that? Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, Notice how he lied there. Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden. He was only taught, he, he, was, he really just meant that one tree. But he threw everything in. It's called deception, good words and fair speeches. And she's like, well, no. And the woman said, uh, and he said to him, she, you shall not give your tree. And the woman said unto him, verse 2, sorry, I lost my place. And the woman said unto the serpent, yeah, we may eat of the, of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Because remember he said, you shall not eat of every tree. No, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. A lot of people teach that she added to it when she said touch. And I, and I agree, you know. When God told Adam, you're just not to eat from it. 
He never, God never said, don't touch it. So we see that there where she's already, she's already got that spirit of, maybe it's okay to add a little bit, just a little bit, to God's word. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He just called God a liar. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Elevating yourself to idolatry level, where you're, you're trying to put yourself as a lowercase g God. You're trying to make yourself equal to God. There was only one man that was ever equal to God, and that's Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not me, not you. Not all these feminists, the woman Jezebel people, women out there. Not the men that have lost their way and decided, I can, I can mess with this to, get to, to go with my narrative. It's lost all my papers that I have in here. That go along with my narrative. Okay, they, they mess this book up to push a narrative that the Bible's not teaching. Okay, why? You've elevated yourself to God, a lowercase g God status. Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. And we just read about that in 1 Samuel 15, 23. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You're starting to idolize yourself. You're starting to make yourself equal to God. Your way is better than God's way. Your words are better than God's words. You know better than God does. Amen. Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, and that it was pleasant for the eyes, and the tree was desired to make one wise, I don't need God's wisdom, I can have my own wisdom. Remember what the Bible says about the wisdom of this world? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? We're supposed to seek God's wisdom. Satan was offering her own wisdom apart from God. You can have your own wisdom apart from God. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Okay. I still believe, like I said, I got more notes, but I'm going to skip them because we're not going to be talking. I got a little bit into trying to say I'm not going to talk about Miriam, and I still talked about Miriam. <laughs> okay. We might do a study on the Jezebel, using Miriam as a bad example of the Jezebel spirit. But we need to get to Aaron, because Aaron's what we're going to be talking about. Okay, Aaron's down here. So we're going to jump down here. Okay? What I believe Aaron's problem was, is A, he was having the same problem as Miriam when it comes to rebelling against God. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. But what God put on my heart to really get at is with Aaron... We've, we've done studies on Aaron. Well, Aaron, he loves the Lord. He wants to do things God's way. And someone comes along and talks him into doing something that's wrong. But if you watch the first video we did, he made a golden calf because the people wanted it. He feared the people. And they talked him into doing it. Afterwards, he's like, this is wrong. He repented. And he got his heart right with God ASAP. And we're going to see here, afterwards, he repented. He got his heart right with the Lord ASAP. But what I believe his problem was... And please, this is for this study, because some are going to say, well, you're just, you know. Aaron's problem was that he was falling for instigators. I believe Miriam was the instigator. And we'll get to that in the end. It's going to be a long process, but we'll get to that in the very end. But today we're going to talk about instigators. And warn you that what keeps you from trusting the Lord with all your heart and acknowledge Him in all thy ways. An instigator comes along, like that serpent that beguiled Eve, an instigator comes along and starts whispering in your ears and gets you to turn against this. Gets you to turn against God's perfect written word. And I've seen it time and time again. I've seen Brethren of Today where an instigator comes along and wishes, I know a great man of God. Well, he was a great man of God. Getting into ministry, he loved the Lord, he loved teaching. Then he turned around and married a Jezebel woman. And that Jezebel woman turned him against the order of authority in the Bible. The Jezebel woman turned him against the gospel that's in the Bible. And that Jezebel woman just destroyed that man of God. Just utterly destroyed that man of God. Why? Because he got someone whispering in his ear, and he started listening to somebody instead of listening to the person he was supposed to listen to. Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. He was supposed to be listening to this. He's supposed to be standing for this. And he started turning on it. He's supposed to be listening to God and doing things God's way. Not his wife's way. Okay. Now in this case, Aaron, Miriam's not Aaron's wife. Miriam is Aaron's sister. We read that. Okay. We read that in Exodus 15.20. Miriam is Aaron's sister. 
Right? And I believe Aaron's sister was whispering in his ears. And there was something in Aaron, I'll say it like this, there was something in Aaron that he, every once in a while he might have thought, well, why, why can't I do what Moses is doing? Why, you know, maybe I, could I be, maybe I'm just as good as Moses. And, and maybe, he, the, the maybes. He had the maybes, could be's, and the Holy Spirit convicted him and he put it down and said, you know what, I'm going to be content with what God has for me. I, I'm the high priest, I'm going to be content with what God has for me. But when you have someone that comes along and starts whispering to encourage the maybes, the could be's, they become, I am better than, than Moses. I can be better than Moses. I'm equal to Moses. I can... See how it changes? I've seen it happen. I've seen people turn on the gospel. I've seen people turn on this book, the Bible version issue. I've seen people turn on the doctrines. Because someone came along and whispered in their ear, and that their little bit of doubts that they have, and they're supposed to trust the Lord with all their heart, Little doubt starts coming in, and someone comes in and starts whispering and starts feeding those doubts. Starts feeding that flesh, that pride. And here, the pride, because we're talking about Miriam and Aaron, the pride, the ego. Aaron's problem, I believe, he's fallen for instigators. And we're going to talk about instigators in the Bible. This is me, okay? The Bible doesn't say Miriam's an instigator. I'm just saying, God put it on my heart to really do a study on instigators and to warn you, brother, says Christ, be careful and beware of instigators. I see them all the time in the body of Christ. I see them all the time on here, causing division among brethren in ministry. Okay. Romans 16.8 says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I remember Chick Tracks put out a book... Um, by, I was looking over the shelf, um, trying to think of his name, he was an ex-Jesuit, Roberto Alvarera, I hope I'm saying, I think I'm saying his last name wrong, but he's an ex-Jesuit, and he talks about when he was a kid, teenager, that him and Whit, both boys and girls were working for the Jesuits, the Catholic Church, and they would be, they would be sent into these Protestant Babel, I call them Babel buildings, they call them church buildings, and they were, and their whole job was to cause trouble. Their whole number one job was to sow seeds of division. And how did they get in? They got in by good words and fair speeches. And once they got in, they started deceiving the hearts of the simple. They started finding the weak. People that already had doubt. People that they found people that were struggling with things, and they magnif they they watered those struggles. They did everything they could to cause trouble, to cause division in the body of Christ. They were two-faced. Over here, oh yeah, you know, there's repentance a part of salvation. Over here, no, there is no repentance of salvation. And I got, I got to see that firsthand. When I first got saved was following King, J back when it was King James Video Ministries, Brian Dunlary, where he was doing hour to two hour Bible studies every week. Expository studies, subject studies, word studies. He was preaching the word, not the world. There was people over there saying, yes, repentance is part of salvation. Then they ran over to Robert Breaker's channel and they were saying, no, no, repentance, that's, that's a false gospel. It's, it's only, it's faith alone. It's only head belief. What is that? They're instigators. They only believed one side. And come to find out they believed the easy believism side. They were liars when they came among us and said, hey, we agree. It's repentance. They're liars. They were deceivers. They were instigators. But they used good words and fair speeches. They could parrot what people said. But we got to watch out for that good words and fair speeches. Remember the Bereans. They checked the scriptures to see if those things were so. And the Bible, Paul talks about, we're supposed to make people prove themselves. Some of these men that were over on King James Video Ministries, I'll call them out. Uh, Edward P.F., King's Table, Deborah Gill, watch out for that one. We're going to talk about Jezebel. That's a Jezebel. But you had all these people that were under King James Video Ministries, and they were saying, yes, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That's true biblical salvation. That's the gospel. But they were over on Robert Breaker's channel saying, no, re repentance is a works. 
and why they were here in King, not here, but in King James Video Ministries comment section, they were kept telling people to go over to Robert Breaker, go over to Robert Breaker, go over to Robert Breaker. They're trying to draw away disciples after they start speaking sp perverse things to draw away disciples after them. They're trying to get people away from the true plan of salvation. That was their whole goal. But they came among us and pretended to be one of us. They lied. But they used good words and fair speeches. And when they were proven to be false, their true colors came out. Who they truly serve came out, Satan. And they're no longer trying to hide it. It's faith alone. It's, you know, easy believism, free grace, all this stuff. And it's like, what about repentance? It's a work. Their true colors came out. They weren't saved. They were never saved. They were instigators. Okay. When you trace back a lot of the division in the body of Christ to date, you will find those kinds of people. What I call false, what the Bible calls, Paul calls false brethren. But Jesus calls them wolves in sheep's clothing. Servants of Satan. When you actually trace it back, you'll see this person got messed up by the instigator. He's not the cause. This person got messed up by the instigator. You're tracing it back. And you trace it back. They're saved. They just got messed up. They got messed up. And you trace it back. You'll find that when you trace it back to the very first it person that says it, the instigator, you're dealing with someone who's lost. Nine out of ten times, you're dealing with a wolf in sheep's clothing, a servant of Satan. Philippians, turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk as you have us for an example. That sounds like proving. That sounds like judgment. It is. Be followers together of me and mark them which walk as you have us for an example. They've proved themselves. They line up with this book. Not just with their words. We got deceived by these guys that came in because it was just their words. It's online. That's why I hate online. Because online it's always just their words. Their words. What about the fruit? What about their works? What about their deeds? You don't see that online. It's so easy to be deceived by servants of Satan online. It's so hard to see brethren that have fallen away, the first steps of falling away, because they're all talk online. I'm all talk online. Not, I'm not saying all talk like you hear about, you know, walk. I try to walk and talk, but you can only see my talk online. But this is Christ. You like to try, to try to walk. Your walk lines up with your talk, but all you see online is the talk. Paul, Paul is saying here, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk their works. You're judging by their works. But we can't see people's works online. That's why this last days, the body of Christ has fallen away. That's why I say the body of Christ is in a bad condition in these last days. We're not doing things God's way. House, church, and street witnessing. Physical flocks coming together and forming house churches is the way to go and survive in these last days before the catching away. But everyone's like, no, I'll just separate myself and just be an online Christian or do online and everything. But I apologize. I get off on that too much. I just, I do this because right now this is the only door that seems to be open. Because you say, well, you're a hypocrite because you're online. Yeah, I know. It's the only door that's open, it seems, because nobody wants to do house churches. I get to fellowship with brethren face to face, praise God. I do Bible studies with brethren through uh, Skype video platforms. So I'm still getting to do that, praise God. It's such a blessing. But, but we're supposed to as walk as you have us for an example. There is judgment. We're supposed to be judging people by their works. And the reason it's hard today is this is where we have our fellowship. We're so spread out. God has us spread out for a reason. We might not make it past November. If you know what November is, all right, we might get caught up. Maybe this is the end. We're getting close to the end. It's The doors are closing, and we're going to get caught uh, as far as to the ministries and everything. But we, I still believe we need to be trying to do things God's way. I've said before, this is a house church of one. If brethren make their way over here, or I meet a brethren here that wants to do a house church, I'm doing a house church in a heartbeat because that's God's way of doing things. You have some men who refuse to do house churches when they could have one. Why? They've been distracted by the world and the world's way of doing things. They've forgotten God's way and they don't want to go back to doing God's way. Whole another issue. Verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often. Walk. You're judging their works. 
You're making them prove thyself. And now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. That story I just gave you, they came in and said, yeah, I'm one of you. Well, yeah, that's the gospel. And while they were in here, they were trying to get everyone to Robert Breaker's channel, and they were trying to sow seeds of division. Is repentance behind everyone's back, especially the preacher's back, and saying, well, you know, maybe repentance isn't really part of salvation. Maybe repentance is works. Maybe repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. True biblical repentance for godly sorrow, sorrow towards God, for what? Your personal sins, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. And there's none righteous, no, not one. For the wages of sin is death, the law of sin and death. Godly sorrow towards God for your personal sins. It's not works, it's not just going from unbelief to belief. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. They don't want to change life. And if you dare call out their sins, I was talking to a brother in Christ recently, you dare call out their sins, you know the first thing they do? They run back to the cross. Paul says, that they that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. And he's talking to brethren, and he's treating them like brethren. If you get into sin and wickedness and someone calls out your sin and wickedness, they're correcting you as a brother or sister in Christ. But these false converts who glory in their shame, you try to call out their sin and wickedness, they go back to, oh, you're just a liberty thief. You're a liberalist. I'm not saved by works. I've heard that before. They always run back to the, the cross because they're using the cross as a credit card for sin. They'll just keep charging their sin. They can live how they glory in their shame. They should be ashamed that, they're, that the old man, that's when you come to the cross, you're ashamed of the old man. You have sorrow in your heart for how wicked and sinful the old man is. That you're thrown at the cross. You're giving, God, you're giving Jesus Christ your life at the cross. You're giving God your life at the cross. And he's giving you a new man, a new creature. But these people glory in their shame. Why? Because they never got saved. They're still the old man. They're still carnally minded walking after the flesh. Here it is, who mind earthly things. Carly mind is walking after the flesh. You would think that after everything Aaron has, has seen and been through, you know, when people turn against God and start doing things the world's way, the flesh's way, remember the, the calf that he built, and they started getting naked and dancing and worshiping this golden calf and partying hardy. You think after everything Aaron had seen and been through, he would not have been so quick to be deceived. All right. Now I want to, we're going to get into the story. We're going to finish the story of Aaron. But I want to get into some Bible examples of people that were instigators and people that got deceived. Okay, and here I'm going to tell you where to turn, pause the video, and I'm going to take pause the video and read the whole story. But I'm just going to summarize the story because this is only the second page, page two. We've got to keep going. Okay. Examples of instigators in the Old Testament. Numbers, verse 16, 1 through 30. Okay. Some of you might know the story. The tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. You can pause the video and read chapters 1 through 35 so you can get the story. But here you have three men that are starting to... The, this is all Levites. They're starting to rebel against Aaron as the high priest. Okay. So these three men, they got 250 other men to also turn on Aaron. These three men were the instigators. Right. It says here, but in truth, they were getting men to turn against God. Okay, These three men got 250 men to turn on Moses and Aaron, but mainly Aaron for the office of the high priest. Well, why can't we be high priests? Remember... Aaron's sons are supposed to be the high priest. It's, it's following Aaron's actual line. Even though they're all Levites, it's Aaron's line that keeps stays in the priesthood as far as being the high priest. You have a priest, but then you have the high priest. And they're complaining that why can't we be the high priest? And you read the story, and they bring uh, their incense to burn before the Lord. But you have these three men, you know, they started instigating the 250. 
Remember Proverbs 3, 5, Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. These three men were the instigators. They got 250 men to turn against, against uh, God when God set up Aaron and his family line for the high priesthood. I put five here because I can't do 250 in one hand, but you can do three on one hand. But this represents 250, okay? They went up there and burnt the incense. These three men didn't go up and burn incense. If you read the story, they wouldn't even go up. They started trouble and then they sat back and waiting to see what would happen. That's how these instigators work. They start trouble and they get back and wait for things to happen. I'll give you an example, a, a nowadays example. We'll get back to the story. I put out a Bible study disagreeing with all the brethren on Christmas. All the brethren on Christmas. And you know what? It's these, there's these instigators online. You know what they did? They cut up the videos and took them and retitled the video. Philip Newton um, corrects Brian Denlinger. Philip Newton reproves Brian Denlinger. Philip Newton does this, you know. You know, and it's like, no, it was for all the brethren. Now, we're not going to get into Christmas, but my, I have plenty of studies on here if you want to know why I don't believe in, that Christmas is godly. I don't believe Christmas pleases God in any way, shape, or form, and I proved it through the scriptures, through Bible studies, okay? But they got that over to Brian Denlinger, and then Brian Denlinger, oh, he betrayed me, and he said... It was for all brethren. All brethren. They made it personal and it sowed division between Brian Denlinger and myself and then it starts causing division where you have followers of Brian Denlinger and then you have followers of Philip. They were just purposely trying to cause division. Purposely. What do we see here? Those three men were doing the same thing. They got these 250 Levites all riled up and worked up against Aaron, and then they just sat back and just watched. And that's what those people did. They sat back and watched, and they watched Brian, my fellowship with Brian Denlinger just completely fall apart. They just watched, and they just, hey, hey, what are those? Those are instigators. Those are instigators. They're out to cause problems. These three men cause problems. Now, if you look at how it ended, why well, I believe these three men were the instigators, and God deals more harshly with instigators is you had God, those three men instigated the whole things. They stayed back in their tents. They didn't go up to burn incense. And God told Moses, tell everyone, separate yourself from these people, these ungodly people. And the earth opened up and swallowed not just these three men, but their wives, their children, and all that they owned were destroyed. That's how God deals with instigators. And you say, well, what about the 250 men? They died also. Well, yes, they died. You want to know why? You want to know why? Go. I don't have it in my notes. You go back to Aaron, his two sons. Remember his two sons? They offered strange fire. They didn't do it the proper way. They offered strange fire, and God killed them. You offer strange fire, you get killed. These 250 men were also killed, but not their families. Not their wives, not their children, just them. And they were killed. Why? Because the only person allowed to offer incense is Aaron and his sons. They offered strange fire before the Lord, and the Lord killed them. But these other three men didn't offer strange fire. They were killed because they were instigators. And God wiped anything that had to do with the instigators out. But you see here, you have instigators. And instigators come along and they got those 250 people to stop trusting the Lord, to stop doing things God's way, in all thy ways acknowledge Him and He should direct His steps. They started doing things the flesh's way, their ego. We're just as good. We're just as good. We're just equal. And you look at how God dealt with that. Another example of an instigator in Jesus' day uh, you turn to Matthew 25, 27, and you can pause the video, Matthew 27, and read verses 15 through 23. And this is Jesus Christ. He's on the cross. Or not cross. It's Jesus Christ. He's with Pilate, Pontius Pilate. And Pilate's saying, who do you want me to, re to release to you? Do you want me to release Barabbas, who's a murderer and a thief? He's a very bad man. 
or do you want me to release? He could have said Jesus Christ, but uh, you're Christ, you're king. He kept saying you're king. But if you read there in Matthew chapter 27, verse 20, it says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. They were instigators. You went, and if you read the story, they were all always scared, always scared, okay, that they would be kicked out of the, the priests. They would get kicked out of the synagogues. If they went against the priests, they'd get kicked out of the synagogues. So the people feared them, but they were also instigators. Hey, say Barabbas, say Barabbas. Wasn't a week before everyone was saying, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest? What happened? These guys start going among the people with fear, fearing them, putting fear in them, because you get kicked out of the synagogue, but they were instigating them to turn on Jesus Christ. And they did. And they're just as guilty for doing it. I believe, it doesn't say this, but I believe they also instigated them when they said, we have no king but Caesar. He, they really got the crowd worked up. Uh, uh, what do you call it? They got the crowd worked up to being really 100% against Jesus Christ. They're still guilty. But you always have those instigators. And I don't have it in my notes, but God talks about those instigators when he talks about it's worse for them. These, these uh, Sadducees and scribes and Pharisees. Right. Uh, Mark 15, chapter 6 through 15 is the same story. It's a parallel story. And Mark 15, 11 says, But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. Instigators. Today you have instigators that try to promote respect of persons. Okay. You have instigators that try to pit uh, a godly man against a godly man. A man in ministry against another man in ministry. You have instigators. Brothers, brothers in Christ that are in ministry, you've got a problem with another brother in Christ, you go to him and you talk to him. And you try to get your both back on the same page where you're striving together. You have the same mind, the same judgment, striving together, fighting for the gospel, fighting for the word of God, on the same page, working together. If you see a brother in Christ you think is falling to the right in ministry, you see a brother in Christ falling to the left in ministry. You go to him. You admonish him to his face, not to a camera, okay? not behind their back. Go to him to their face. But you have all these instigators that are trying to pit man of God against each other. They're trying to pitch the brethren against each other. They didn't trust the Lord. They did a week ago. They did a week ago. I'm reading the book of John right now. It's where I'm at in my uh, morning and evening readings. And they did. They said some because of, what was it, he raised Lazarus. Lazarus was with them, and they believed because of Lazarus was there, that he raised from the dead. They saw the miracle. But then a week later, their hearts got turned from God. Beware of an instigator, brother says Christ. Be a Berean and do things God's way. And you're going to realize that the instigators are always going to try to get you away from doing God's way. If you see a brother and sister in Christ that you believe is in sin, um that's doing something worldly, getting into idolatry, pride, what ego, whatever, vanity, uh, lust of the flesh, you go to them and you correct them through the Word of God in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. And for adventure they would recover themselves out of the snare of the devil that are taken captive by him at his will. That's the whole point. You want to see that brother get back, or sister in Christ get back on the right path. When you have people come along trying to get you to fight you know, fight, fight, fight each other. Get into arguments, get into debating, name-calling, mocking, bearing false witness. Those are instigators. Those are instigators. You know, a great man of God, did he let instigators get the better of him and puff up his pride that was already there, and he turned his back on a lot of the brethren and stabbed a lot of brethren in the back. That those instigators, God's going to hold more accountable than him, but God's still going to hold him accountable. He's going to hold me accountable. I failed the Lord sometimes. Don't fall for instigators. An example of instigators in the New Testament. Turn to Acts 19. Acts 19, 21 through 41. 
And you can pause and read the story. Okay. And then 24, Acts 19, 24, it says, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. In other words, they made a lot of money off of it. That's, that's, his way of uh, that's his way of living and survival. He makes money off of pagan statues to Diana, a god, a false god, the lowercase g god. 25, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation. He called them together and said, Sirs, know we, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. He brought them together. He started instigating. And if you read the story, he got them all riled up at, Paul was there, but men standing up preaching the word of God and getting people saved, and the people getting saved, they, don't, they won't buy that statue anymore. He's losing money. So what does he do? He gets people riled up, and inst he's an instigator. And they go into, they grab the two men, they didn't grab Paul, they grab the two men that were there, and they dragged him in there. And for, I think it's for a space of an hour, they kept uh, yelling, Diana of the Ephesians, Diana, great is that Diana of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians. This is an instigator. Now, in 2 Timothy 4, go ahead and pause if you have to, to turn there. 2 Timothy 4.14, you have Demetrius, who's a silversmith. Then you have 2 Timothy 4.14, you have Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou were all, of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Now I got into a disagreement with the brother in Christ that says that Paul always named names. No, he didn't. I've proven that easy. Paul didn't always name names. But why did Paul name Alexander the coffersmith? Why? Because he's an instigator. Just like I name names today. They were instigators coming over under King James Video Ministries platform on YouTube, uh, the ministry, and they were in the comment section sowing seeds of division. Okay? They were instigators. Paul's calling out an instigator. Acts 19, it uses the man Demetrius. Notice it didn't name all the other people that he got together with that helped him march into the city and helped him with all that stuff. It just named the instigator. Demetrius. Here in 2 Timothy 4, 18, Alexander. Then you have these instigators. Now these are lost people, but they're coming in to get to turn the people. The people are starting to get saved. People are starting to say, well, wait a minute. They might not be saved yet, but they're like, uh, if you read about Paul when he was in Rome, he went to the synagogues. The Jews didn't want to hear, but the Gentiles came to him. They didn't get saved yet, but they came to him and said, we would hear more of this matter. So the next Sabbath day, he would teach more on what he, Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ is and what he did for him. But these instigators are trying to come in to get them to where they won't come to him and say, we would heal more on this matter. They were trying to prevent people from hearing more on the truth. They're instigators. Right. Remember Proverbs 3, 5, Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Now, this, in this situation, they're trying to prevent people from getting saved. But those people in their heart, they're like, my heart tells me, you know, the Holy Spirit is convicting him that what Paul and his, the men that were with him, what they're saying was true. But someone comes along and gets him to stop trusting the Lord. The Lord was reaching them. And get them to turn on the Lord. And lead not in thy own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct my path. Who were they were acknowledging? Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They weren't acknowledging the Lord Most High, the creator of heaven and earth, creator of all things. The Lord God that sets up kingdoms and teareth down kingdoms, that gives life and takes it away. Right. So I grabbed these three examples. Uh, there's probably a lot more other examples of what I consider wolves in sheep's clothing. What I fit, what fit, these men are not of God. They're of the devil. You're of your father the devil. The lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning, and the father of it, children of the devil, are liars. These men were lying in all these three situations. They were deceiving the people to turn them against God Almighty. Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty. Now, here's a tough one for you guys to, to, to realize. 
Can brethren fall for being examples of instigators? Can, can someone who's truly saved and born again be an instigator? Get deceived into being an instigator where they start, you know, some, it could be Satan whispering in their ears, the flesh is whispering in their ears. Can, is it possible for someone who's saved and born again to be an instigator? All right. Turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. How many of you remember where Jesus stand there with his disciples and he asked them, who do you say that I am? Or no, who do people say that I am? And they go through and say, some say um, Isaiah the prophet, some say John reborn, uh, some say one of the prophets, you know. Then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, uh, flesh and bo uh, bones, I don't know if he said flesh and bones, but somehow like flesh hasn't taught you this. You didn't learn this from the world. God taught you this. Then Jesus goes in to talk about how, and on this stone, thou art Peter, and on this stone, this rock, I'm sorry, this rock, and this rock is who Peter said Jesus was. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That rock isn't Peter. That rock is still Jesus Christ, being the Christ, the Son of the living God. God manifests in the flesh. I shall build my church. And then shortly after, he says, he starts telling them about how he's going to die. He starts prophesying his death, how he's going to die and be buried and rose again the third day. And here we are, Matthew 16, 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, when Peter rebuked him and said, No, Lord, this is not going to happen. Be it far from me. I will not, he doesn't say I, but it's like, I will not allow this to happen. But he said, be it far from me, this shall not happen. And he said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now stop for a second. You're like, well, what does this have to do with being an instigator? Brothers and Christ, this is where 2 Timothy 2.15 comes in. Rightly dividing and studying to show thyself approved. What is happening here is God manifests in the flesh, is giving His Word. Let's, let's talk about what's happening here. He's giving His Word. When He speaks, it's God speak. It's the Word of God. It's like today when we try to preach the Word of God to some people, like the Trinitarians. Well, this is a Trinitarian passage. Where is actual Trinity in the Bible? Triune God in the Bible. Okay. This, we give them God's Word, and they can't help but add to it or reject it. They can, but they choose to add to it or reject it. But we talked about that indoctrination. Today we see it a lot among even, I believe, saved sinners. And I'm working on that indoctrination and trying to say things God's way, the right way, when I say, thus saith the Lord. Not when I'm just talking in general, but when we say, thus saith the Lord, this is fundamentals of the faith, this is the faith, this is well, how we're supposed to do things. It better be in here. We better be saying it God's way. This is God manifest in the flesh. God the Father is speaking through His body, His Son, capital S, Son of, of, of God, Jesus Christ. And Peter's denying the Word of God. Prophecy of death and resurrection, and Peter's going against it. He called Jesus a liar with his actions and his words. You say, well, where is this instigation? Well, if you go to the parallel passage in Mark, this is amazing what God, show, God can show you if you stay in God's Word and you keep reading it. I read this a million times. It didn't hit me until God had me do this study. Not a million times, but you know what I'm saying. I've read it so many times, gone over it so many times, and just glossed over it. Turn to Mark chapter 8, verse 33. Mark chapter 8, verse 33. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples... He, he, rebuking Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou, art, for thou sayest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Notice what it says there. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples. Why did Jesus turn and look on his disciples? Because Peter's actions could start growing. Peter's actions could infect the rest of them. He can start becoming an instigator. So Jesus put a stop to it ASAP. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest the things that be of men, and not thou savest the things that be of thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. 
You wonder why Peter says then that sin rebuke before all, that others may fear? The man that's a heretic after the first and second admonition reject? Why? We need to put a stop ASAP to anybody trying to instigate before it becomes instigation. It could be just one person's act, but their act can start instigating other people to start doing the same thing they did. And I put, wrote down, because of Brother in Christ, when I was talking to him about this study, Mark 8.33, Mark 8.38. Mark 8. When you get there at Mark 8.33, we got through that story. Verse 34, it said, And when he called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto him, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Peter wasn't denying himself, the flesh, the world. He was denying who? The Word of God, capital W, Word of God. And take up his cross and follow me, and whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for so? Here it is, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The end of the time of Jacob's trouble. But the key here is, is he just got finished rebuking Peter because he looked at the people. He looked at, it says right here, but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he turned and had to rebuke Peter ASAP, and then he turned around and, and did a teaching saying, hey, what Peter just did was wrong. Don't do it. Don't make the same mistake. Don't be ashamed of my words like some people are today. Very ashamed. And you say, well, Peter wasn't saved right now, because technically he wasn't. But did Peter make another mistake where he started being an instigator as a saved man? Uh, Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Turn to Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. What is he being blamed for? Keep reading. For before that certain came from James... He did eat with Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, not trusting the Lord with all his heart. His own understanding, his own fears of the world started coming in. Acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he shall direct thy steps. He didn't acknowledge God's way. He had that vision the, the blanket came down with all the animals. What I've made called, what I've made clean, call thou not common. And afterwards, he called him to go preach the gospel to Gentiles. And here he is again, backpedaling again, fearing them which are of the circumcision. And the other Jews, here's the instigating part. And the other Jews assembled likewise with him. He started something he shouldn't have started, and it started spreading. So what did Paul have to do? He was an instigator. So Paul had to rebuke him to his face that others may fear. That's how you handle instigators. You correct them on the spot to their face, not to a camera, to their face in front of everyone that others may fear. And that's what Paul did. The Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas, who was going around with Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, preaching to the Gentiles that even Barnabas was, start, was also was carried away with their dissimulation. So it wasn't just the you know, good words and fear speeches deceiving the hearts of the simple. It wasn't just like these might be newly saved people that Peter was, or Peter was you know, instigating, getting them to do the wrong thing. It was men of God in ministry that he was messing up. Do we know of some men on YouTube that their ministry is falling away and they're starting to instigate and mess people up by not standing for this book? I do. Great men of God. Great men of God. But they're losing their way. Peter was losing his way. It took another brother to re re rebuke him to his face 
And the Holy Spirit and Paul bared witness with the Holy Spirit and Peter, and I believe Peter got his heart right with God. Some men don't want to get their heart right with God on, online. Verse 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, wouldn't it, when you saw that they walked not uprightly, then why don't you yell at everybody? The truth of the gospel. I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compelst thou the Gentiles to live after the Jews? And you can read that whole situation. He got corrected. What it was is, he was ashamed to sit with the Gentiles because the Jews are not supposed to have any dealings with the Gentiles as far as, um, you can do business dealings, but you're not to fellowship. You're not to hang out and talk and fellowship with Gentiles. That's why Paul was scared to go originally, if you go back to the story about the blanket coming down, all the animals, and God was teaching that the animals that are, that are clean or unclean, God has made clean. Salvation has gone out to the world now. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven has been put off. Now it's the time of the Gentiles, the gospel that's revealed to Paul. Okay? Gentiles can get saved and they're now clean because God cleaned them. God cleaned me. He washed my sins white as snow. He washed your sins white as snow. We're clean. You can fellowship with us. You can talk with us. But when the other Jews came around, he started going back like we're under the Old Testament, where he couldn't have any business, any, any fellowship or talking with, with the Gentiles. He's being two-faced. He's acting like one thing when the Jews are there. He's acting another way when the Gentiles are there. But he became an instigator because he got other people to make the same mistake. Brother says, Christ, are you becoming an instigator? Are you doing things God's way? Are you causing division in the body of Christ because you're instigating and getting brethren to turn on one another? Now you can stand for the truth, and the truth divides, and people can either stand for the truth or they can choose the world. There's nothing you can do. I've learned the hard way. There's nothing you can do. They want the world. They want lust of the flesh. They want idolatry and covetousness and worldliness and... They start getting into doing things Satan's way, and they won't get back to doing what's right. You've tried helping them. They won't do it. You put them out. You give them to the Lord, and you put them out. There's nothing you can do at that point other than pray. I always say that. There's nothing you can do, and God corrects me. You pray for them that God will send somebody into their life that they'll listen to, that will open their eyes to what they've become. So far from this. They still have a, a, the look of organized religion now. There used to be good Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries online, but a lot of them now look like organized religion, worldly religions online. But their heart is far from the Lord and more towards the world. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What you see here, what's happening to Peter, uh, Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Brothers of Christ, Paul says, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. If you're following Paul, you're following Christ. If you skip Paul and go straight to the Gospels, you're going to get messed up, because Jesus was primarily preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom of Heaven. He, we still learn from it. I'm, like I said, I'm in John right now. Learning as much as I can, instruction and righteousness. But doctrine is in the Pauline epistles. Okay? Jesus did prophesy this time period. There's times in the, in the Gospels where Jesus is talking about this time period, but Paul also talks about it. Because Paul makes it a big point that he is the apostle appointed by Jesus Christ. Be followers of me as I am of Christ. Follow us as you have us for an example. Brother, says Christ, it's going to get to the point in these last days where you're going to have to make a choice. Am I going to follow Paul? Am I going to follow the early Christians like Timothy, Titus, Philemon? Right? I believe the Pauline epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and 1st Peter are for us today. But everything you get in those, you get in the Pauline epistles too, from 1st John, like 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and 1st Peter. They're written to the first Peter's right. I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but first Peter is written to the Jews for today to get saved. And it's written in the way that the Jews, like you're really addressing the Jews that get saved today. Okay. 
But what he says in there does apply to the whole body of Christ. And what I believe in 1 Peter. When you get to 2 Peter, it says, like faith. He's talking about the faith and works that are in the time of Jacob's trouble. 2 Peter's for the time of Jacob's trouble. All right? So I'm not just 100% stuck on the Pauline epistles. But Paul said, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Follow us as you have us for an example. He's talking about Timothy, Titus, um, Silas. I'm trying to think of the name of the men that were working alongside Paul. But brothers of Christ, it's going to get to a point where you're going to have to make a choice to follow this or follow whoever it is staying behind the pulpit in these Babel buildings because you can't do both. There was a time when you could because that man lined up with this and you were following this. But it's, coming to, it's getting to the point where you're going to have to make a decision to follow this no matter what, even if that means that you have to say, hey, I can't follow... I, you know, putting men of God behind these, I can't have anything to do with you until you get your heart right with the Lord and get back to line up with this book. Men on YouTube, the video platforms, they're straying from this book. They're getting distracted by the world. I'm sorry, i gotta, I got to follow Paul, and I've got to follow this book, and I can't follow you anymore because you don't line up with this book. It's going to be hard. It's going to lead to loneliness. But it seems easier to conform, so you don't have that loneliness. It's easier to conform than to go against the flow. Someday we'll talk about the respecter of persons in more detail in this series of studies. Find some guy that's a hardcore respecter of persons. Actually, no. The third story of Aaron, we're going to be talking about being respecter of persons. I'm of this person, so it doesn't matter if he lines up with this book or not. I've got to follow him. And you conform to that person instead of... Conforming to this, being, instead of being transformed by the renewing of your mind, you're conforming. It's easier to conform, in it, conform than to go against the flow. Fear is a good motivator. Fear is. Remember we talked about the uh, sat, uh, Pharisees got the people to turn on Jesus Christ. I think the first part was fear. They feared the Pharisees being kicked out of the synagogue. Okay. But good words and fair speeches and having teachers having itching ears plays a big part in it too. When someone comes along and starts feeding some of your, I have faults. Remember the Bible says we're supposed to confess our faults one to another? You can have someone come along and see that fault start to rear its ugly head again. And they'll come around and try to feed it. They see a little pride there. They start watering the pride and want it to grow. They're using good words and fair speeches, but they don't have your best intentions at heart. Especially if they are telling you what you want to hear, feeding off your flesh and worldliness. Hey, Aaron. Let's get back to Aaron. Hey, Aaron. You're just as important as Moses, don't you think? I mean, I believe I'm just, this is Miriam. I believe I'm just as important as Moses. Now, someone says, what if Moses did it the other way? Let's, I mean, Aaron was the instigator instead of Miriam, because you got those Jezebel women that want to fight. Uh, it's the same thing. If Aaron was whispering her eyes and say, hey, we're just as good as Moses. Of course, back then, the men had their place, the women had their place, the children had their place. You keep looking at it from the eyes of today where the boundaries have been destroyed. You look at America, the boundaries have been destroyed. There is no women's. Uh, men don't have their, their boundary. You take women's boundaries, men's boundaries, and children's boundaries that are supposed to be separate. Today they've been put into one big circle, and it's just one big mess. It's just one big mess. Right? But whoever it was, in this case I'm doing the teaching where Miriam is instigating Aaron. She thinks, well, she's just as good as Aaron, but she doesn't want to go challenge him alone. So she goes over to, and the Bible doesn't say this, this is just me talking about inst the way instigators work. They'll never want to go out alone and stand up alone. They'll try to get it, work up a crowd. Remember those three men that worked up 250 Levites to turn against Aaron? They don't want to go by themselves. They always want a crowd. They always want to build people up. They, they're too cowardly to do it by themselves. But just think of this as Miriam going, Hey, Aaron, you're just as important as Moses. He's not better than you are. You work just as hard as he does. You've sacrificed just as much as he does. You were in the ministry with him there in, in Egypt, and, and you, you were there. You performed some miracles too. And what happens? 
you start feeding someone's ego and they stop trusting the Lord with all their heart. Their own understanding starts getting in the way. Then they stop acknowledging the Lord because when Mar Miriam and Aaron stood against Moses, they weren't acknowledging the Lord in all their ways. They were acknowledging their flesh. Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye hath God said. 2 Timothy 4.1 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. His appearing, the judgment seat of Christ. That's what we're supposed to be looking for. That blessed hope in the judgment seat of Christ. That's what we're working towards, brothers and Christ. Not the time of Jacob's trouble. Just a quick rebuke of some of the men here in, in YouTube on ministry that they're getting so distracted by the world and the time of Jacob's trouble they're getting everyone to look for the time of Jacob's trouble and they're not living a life of Christ they're starting to fumble brothers says Christ you're I, I'm guilty sometimes too we start fumbling we start falling we start getting distracted by the world no, we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope and we're supposed to be exhorting the brethren to keep looking for that blessed hope with the life that we're living and in this study, don't get distracted or deceived by instigators that are trying to mess you up and mess up your walk with the Lord. They're trying to ruin your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. At His appearing and His kingdom. At the end of the thousand year reign, Satan gets let loose for a season. God destroys the heaven and the earth. And then there's the judgment seat, the great white throne judgment. That's what that's talking about. Two, preach the word. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be instant in season, out of season. Right now it seems out of season, and brethren are getting distracted by what's going on in the world. If it, if, if it looks like we could get caught home any day, we still need to focus on keep our eyes on that blessed hope. The judgment seat of Christ. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Where do we get our sound doctrine from primarily? The, the Pauline epistles. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, instigators. I'll tell you what you want to hear if you come over here and follow me. Throw your money at me and come over here and follow me. I'll tell you what you want to hear. Verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. I've, I've heard brethren getting attacked because you have men that are pushing the world, the world, the, the mark of the beast, the one world order, the worldwide economic collapse that brings in the mark of the beast, uh, who's the antichrist and, and everything. And there, uh, someone in the comment section says, uh, we're not supposed to be looking for the antichrist. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. And they got attacked for it. And one of the things that they were attacked with, the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Yeah, for your adversary the devil going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you're getting distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble, you're getting devoured by Satan. We're not supposed to be looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not supposed to be acting like we're going to be going through the time of Jacob's trouble. you got some in a ministry that they're preaching, Oh, I, I, I'm a pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the Bible, the body of Christ believer, but they're living and acting and they're even teaching, like talking like they're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. And they're so distracted by it. Here it says, Watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. And if you're truly sober and you're truly vigilant, and you're not letting the adversary of the devil just devour you like a roaring lion, it's because you're keeping your eyes on that blessed hope, the judgment seat of Christ. You're not being sober and being vigilant if you take your eyes off Jesus Christ, the blessed hope, the judgment seat, and you put it on the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not going to be there. It's not for us. So why are people getting so worked up about what's going on in the world? They're getting distracted. And you have a lot of instigators. Some, I believe, are saved. They're instigating. And they're taking your eyes off Jesus Christ. But watch thou in all things... Endure affliction, no matter what's going on in the world. Wars, rumors of wars, doesn't matter. If there's famines here, there's famines there, doesn't matter. Endure affliction. Keep living for Jesus Christ. 
Keep staying in this book. Keep staying in prayer. Keep loving your brothers and sisters in Christ and being there for one another. Keep living the life of Christ, being a living witness and a verbal witness, an ambassador for Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. When someone is appealing to your flesh and vanity, or even piquing your interest, oh, the time of Jacob's trouble, ooh, this might be it, ooh, they're starting to pique your interest. There's nothing wrong, brother, says Christ, about talking about it every once in a while. I talk it every once in a while. But we need to stay focused. Okay. We're, a, I never look for the Antichrist. I, 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 I might have, I'll have to correct myself. I might have gotten talked into it, but I never go out of my way to look for the Antichrist. I'll say it like that. Okay. To try to make teachings about who's going to be the Antichrist today. I've talked to brother about who I think might be the false prophet. You know, someone who's running for president in the United States. But... That, but I keep saying, when we get to heaven, we're going to look down and go, okay, I thought this guy was going to be the false prophet, and he wasn't. I thought this guy was going to be the man. That, and you wasted your time trying to figure out who this is when it had nothing to do with us, and you needed to spend your time looking for that blessed hope in this book, studying it, hiding it in your heart, and living it. That's where you need to spend your time. Praying for the brethren. Being there for your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's where you need to spend your time. Fellowship. Now, I believe that Aaron might have thought a time or two, I'm just as good as Moses. Getting back to Aaron. I'm just as good as Moses, but got convicted. But when someone brings that out of you, you do not trust the Lord or acknowledge Him. You start trusting yourself, your own understanding. Your pride and self-worth seem to come into play. Brother, says Christ, I've seen that destroy so many men and women in the body of Christ. Pride and self-worth. Well, I'm worth something. Don't get me wrong. Pride's wrong, period, but the self-worth. I'm worth something to the Lord. But I am His instrument. I am a servant of the Lord. And the Bible says we give Him all the glory. All the glory. And when we start taking the glory for ourselves because we think we're self-worth, making videos about how important this ministry is to you and everything, and how important I am to you in ministry. Self-worth. Okay? Not how important God is. How important it is, brothers and Christ, that you stay in this book every day. Start your day with this book and you end your day with this book. Get into Alexander Scorvey listening to the Old Testament being read. I do it Old Testament over and over, and I read the New Testament in the mornings and in the evenings when I start my day with the Word of God and end the day with the Word of God, and then with my Bible studies, it takes me all through the whole Bible, like we're, we're going through today. Okay? This is what's important. This can get shut down. I can get kicked off of YouTube. I, you know, I could, God could say, you know what, it's your time to come home, buddy. Time, your time to come home, Philip. I'm talking about in death. He could catch, catch me away in death. And if this is what's more important instead of this, if this is more important, self-worth, when I go, what happens? The body of Christ scatters. You know a good example of that? Peter Ruckman. When he went, a lot of it was engineered, and that cult of personality and that respect of person was around Peter Ruckman. And everything just kind of split, fell apart. That ministry that he was part of fell apart. It's not the same ministry as it was when Peter Ruckman was there. Why? Because they engineered it around a man. Self-worth. Brothers of Christ, I am not worth anything if I don't line up with this. And even then, it's not me that's worth anything. I'm showing you what's worth something. God's Word, the Lord. Keep looking for Him. Keep looking for Him. Right. Romans 12.3 says, For I say, through the grace of given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Remember, being sober, be vigilant for your adversary the devil, going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. When you start getting puffed up in pride and thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think, self-worth, I'm worth. No, you, I don't deserve to be treated this way. I know a brother in Christ who had the hardest time in the world thanking God when someone would attack him for standing for the truth. But Lord, 
I'm going through this for you, O oh Lord, to, to God be the glory. Let you be glorified in my suffering. They're attacking me for preaching the truth. They're calling me names, mocking me, making up stories about me. Lord, to God be the glory. If I'm suffering for you, O oh Lord, to God be the glory. But you have some of these men, how dare you talk to me like that? Oh, I'm an elder in the church, an ordained elder. I'm a bishop, I'm a deacon. The laborer is worthy of his work. They start going through it. What about the, those verses are good verses, but what about the verse of, you know, give God glory in all things? Give him thanks in all things. What about those? Satan sees the pride in these men, and he goes in there, and he starts feeding that pride to the point where he, they can be devoured by Satan. But think soberly. You lined up with this. According, to, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay. Once again, it talks about everyone, even men don't have the same office. We have, you know, I'm not an evangelist. God's never called me to be an evangelist. You know, I'm not, I don't have the gift of healing. And I'm talking about like, some people study books and read and learn how, what food to eat to help you with certain sicknesses. What uh, plants you can turn into a, a balm. It's called a balm, it's a rub that you put on burns, you put on cuts, infections. I mean, they learn these things because God has given them a gift of, you know, a heartfelt desire to love these things and learn these things. Okay. But we're not all given the same gifts. And in the same, like I said, I'm just a Bible teacher. I'm not, I tried some preaching. We did try some preaching recently. I put my hand in preaching. But I'm a Bible teacher more than anything. Okay. I'm not a ordained elder. I'm not a bishop. I'm not a deacon. I don't have the gift of prophecy. Some men can set... We don't have new prophecies today. Everything is here now. Okay? But some men have the gift of prophecy that I use for today in the sense that they can go through this book and they can show you where these prophecies have been fulfilled, where these prophecies have yet to be fulfilled. Here's when they're going to be fulfilled in the timeline of the different dispensations and this and that. God has really given them a gift. That's not me. You know, maybe in the future God can change, give me that gift, but that's not me. We all have different gifts. And we all need to be content with what God has for us. Okay? Miriam and Aaron were not content with what God had for them. And their pride and self-worth started getting puffed up. And like I said, I believe Aaron got instigated. I'll show you why when we get there. But first, how are we supposed to be today? Are we supposed to be those instigators? Are we supposed to be falling for those instigators? Because brothers in Christ, we can become instigators if we're pushing something that's wrong. Now, I wasn't the instigator, but I carried on the instigation. When, when I used to say John was exiled to the island of Patmos, I was passing on a false teaching. Okay? Why? But that's still, I'm still guilty. But you have to trace it back to who was the first person that started it, that's still spreading it, and that's the person that needs to be rebuked before all men. He's the number one person. Anybody can get re rebuked, but he's the number one person. But how are we supposed to be today? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty and not walking in craftiness. These instigators, like when you trace it back to the instigator, that serpent, that servant of Satan, they try to use craftiness. They use dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Yea, hath God said, Thou shalt not eat from all the trees of the garden? God never said that. They used it as a talking point to get Eve to start talking to him. But they handled the word of God deceitfully. See, this is a Trinity verse. See, this is faith alone. They handled the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, the truth, we stand for the truth, the manifestation, the fruits, our walk, not just our talk, but our walk, the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3, But if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. 
I'm learning today that there's some brethren I thought were saved that, I don't know, they're just a big question mark. They've turned on the true plan of salvation. They can get messed up. The Satan can come in and get you messed up on doctrine. He can get you messed up when it comes to instruction and righteousness. But the main doctrine, when it comes to the gospel that you got saved off of, the Bible says not to be repented of. And when you have men that send there and turn on the true plan of salvation that they supposedly got saved off of, you become the biggest question mark. Have blind the minds of them which believe not. How does God, how does Satan, not God, how does Satan blind people, the lowercase g God of this world? He's flooded this world with false gospels. Gospels that appeal to the flesh. You know, people having, teachers having itching ears. I like that gospel because I can continue in the flesh. I don't have to repent. I like that gospel, faith alone, because faith, the Bible says, not of yourselves, yet now I can make it of myself. I did something to save myself. I, I like this gospel over here because it says I can earn salvation. If I earned it, then I can do whatever I want because I've earned it. I can live however I want and I can do whatever I want. I'll just take uh, two turtle doves, like in the Old Testament, just take a couple turtle doves and a lamb. I've got a plan for next week's sin that I plan on sinning. Which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, if you truly gave your life to Jesus Christ at the cross, the old man was thrown at the foot of the cross, God's going to give you a new man. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And here it is, verse 5. For we preach not ourselves. What? You mean it's not supposed to be about self-worth? Pride and self-worth? It's not, it's not supposed to be about me, myself, and I? The self-entity? For we preach not ourselves, but for Christ Jesus the Lord, ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. What do, the number one thing that these instigators do is they start making it about you individually. Well, you should be able to do this, and you should be, and it takes your eyes off Jesus Christ. I'm just a servant of Jesus Christ. It's not all about me. It's all about the Lord and His perfect written word. And instigators come along and take your eyes off Jesus Christ, mainly that blessed hope, the judgment seat of Christ. They get your eyes off this, and they get you to start saying things your own way, the flesh's way, the world's way. They, they start elevating the flesh, and you start your own understanding. For thou savest not the things that be of men of God, but the things that be of men. The flesh's way versus God's way. I believe Marin stroked Aaron's ego and he was blinded. Now Aaron is guilty 100%. But we're going to find out who the instigator is. You know what instigator means in the Webster's 1828 dictionary? And this does line up with the word of God. Okay. That which incites, that would be Peter, was the bad example. You incite something that goes against the Word of God. You're setting a bad example, and there's people that start following. You're inciting something, okay, that you shouldn't be doing, or a way that's not the right way, or a teaching that's not right. That, here's the second definition. That which moves persons to commit wickedness, Your their whole intent is to get people to commit wickedness. Remember we talked about those three men, those 250 men? Those three guys got those 250 men to commit witness, and they just stood back. Those Pharisees got all those people to say Bar Barabbas, and they just stood back all proud of themselves. Today you have people to do the same thing. They cause all kinds of trouble. Oh, Philip rebukes Brian Denlinger for this. But Philip rebukes that. And in that video, I never mentioned his name. I mentioned the sin. Brothers is Christ... Was he making the mistake that I was teaching against? Absolutely. But I was calling out everyone. I was calling out everyone. The best way to do something is you teach people what is right, so then when they see what is wrong, they know how to avoid it. You don't just teach people, okay, this person's wrong, that person's wrong, that person's wrong, and you're sitting there and they're all like, well, if all these people are wrong, what is the right way? 
Maybe you should have started with the right way. That's how you're supposed to preach and teach. You just teach what's the truth. And you get people so knowing what the truth is and so familiar with the truth that when lies and falsehoods come along, they can see right through it. But you've got these instigators. Their whole point is to cause division, cause destruction. They're trying to get you into sin and wickedness. They're trying to mess you up. They're trying to mess up your walk with the Lord. I was going to say ruin, but basically they're trying to steal your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. They're trying to mess up your walk with the Lord so you'll get less rewards, if any. Okay. All the other examples we had when it came to, before we started talking about Peter, were examples of Peter, of not Peter, but of people that I believe Satan got the better of them, their flesh got the better of them, the world got the better of them, the three enemies. And their whole point was they wanted to move people for, to do wickedness. You know who does a lot of instigating online in the body of Christ today? <laughs> we already talked about it a little bit, but, you know. Who does a lot of instigating in the body of Christ today? 2 Corinthians 11.3. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Let's use the Word of God, but I've talked about people that have done it. But For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvels, for Satan himself is transformed into the angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed in the minister of righteousness, whose end shall be according to the works. Remember when Jesus called him and said, You're of your, your father the devil, his, the devil's ministers? Those are the number one people that do instigating and cause as much problem as they possibly can. Matthew 23, 27 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful and outwardly. Good words and fair speeches. They look good. But within, within full of dead man's bones and all of uncleanness. When you actually prove these people, according to this book, and see if they walk along with their talk, lines up with this book, inwardly they're full of dead man's bones. These instigators that are servants of Satan. 2 Corinthians 11.26 says, And journeyings often, in perils of water, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea. But here's the thing. And perils among false brethren. I was talking about brother in Christ. You go through Genesis. Oh, Genesis. We're going through Gen um, Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Luke. It starts with a G. Galatians. First and Second Corinthians, Galatians. You start getting into some of those books. And Paul is dealing with people coming in, pretending to be one of you. And then getting them to turn on the gospel. First and Second Corinthians are this is, is a good example of this so-called easy believism today. Faith alone, we can sin all we want to sin, and and they never repented and believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You have you have that false gospel coming in. Well, now that Jesus died, he died to justify sin, so we can sin all we want. That's what this basically this easy believism is. Now, don't get me wrong. They will give up certain sins to be part of certain groups, so they'll give up the sins they want to give up. We're talking about sins across the board. What the Bible says is sin, period. They'll still hold on to sins. These, faith, the, the, these false converts that are part of easy believism, faith alone. They still hold on to sins that the Bible calls sin. First of all, adding to and subtracting from the Word of God is their number one sin. They don't want the true plan of salvation. But he says, among false brethren, these are servants of Satan. They come in and they start messing everything up. First St. Corinthians, it's about easy, I believe, easy believism is being preached. Oh, Jesus, you just have the knowledge that Jesus died for you and you can continue living however you want to live. No changed life, no repentance, no changed life. Paul has to come in there and set them straight. Galatians, you have someone come in there saying, well, yeah, repentance towards God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and asking God to save you. Yeah, that's good and all. We did that. That's good. But you know what else you need to do? You also need to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. you got to do works along with your faith. You're not just justified by faith. Remember I said we're justified by faith today in the time of the Gentiles. We're justified by faith and there's works on the side that prove our faith. Prove our conversion. 
I'm not the same man I was before I got saved, brother says Christ. Neither are you if you truly got saved. You can look back and say, I'm not the same man. Okay. But they come in and say, now you got to do works also. So you're just you, you can't be you're not justified by faith. You're justified by your works. They get them away from the faith and get them into works. Keeping the Levitical laws. Ordinances. Today, it used to be that, that time period when you're getting to Galatians and 2nd, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. It was the Jews coming in. You'll see that the Jews are mentioned a lot in all the Pauline epistles. Things that a Jew would understand and a Gentile wouldn't, but a Jew would. Because there's Jews present. Jews are coming in and messing them up. Today, it's the Catholic Church and her daughters. They come in and they have their own set of ordinances, their own set of rules, their own set of laws. You know, the Eucharist. You have to say so many Hail Marys. you got to confess your sins to a priest. You can pay to, to, for forgiveness. Indulgences, indulgences, they have their own set of rules, but they're still trying to get people back under a, a working-based system in order to be saved. Okay? A pair among false brethren coming in. What are those false brethren? They're ministers of Satan. Galatians 2, 4. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. That's where our liberty starts. That's where our liberty ends. In Christ Jesus. That they might bring us into bondage. What's the bondage there? They're trying to get them back under the Levitical laws. Circumcision and the laws of Moses. Holy day, Sabbath day, new moon. Touch not, taste not, eat not. Okay. Proverbs, but like I said, these are the people that are the biggest instigators that you're going to find. Proverbs 6.16 these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Seven are abomination. They'll say the seventh one is that. No. What I believe this is saying is, is it's not the seventh one that's the abomination. If you're doing all seven, you're an abomination. But all these things he hates. But if you're doing all seven, you're an abomination unto him. A proud look. I know brethren who fall for that. that are failing that. A lying tongue. I know brethren who fail in both. A hands that shed innocent blood. Now, we don't shed innocent blood like physically, but the Bible says if you hate your brother in your heart, something along the lines about you can murder in your heart with your with your your actions, not actions, your attitude, your feelings towards somebody. Okay. But this says shed innocent blood. I want to I'm gonna go with physical, okay, physically. No, the brethren aren't doing that, praise God. But you had people in Catholicism, the Catholic Church, false brethren, that they're doing this. They're, they've shed the blood of the saints. The Catholic Church is the number one organization that's responsible for the most deaths among true Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, Christians. Verse 18, A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations... Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, cartoons, uh, the sports industry, the uh, music industry. Um, books, fairy tale books, fables, fans. And they're always pushing. If you look at a lot of that stuff, they're always pushing wicked things. And they get people to imagine, ooh, I wish I could be like that actor. I wish I could be like that sports person. Ooh, ah. Feet that be swift and running to mischief, just causing trouble. I know I've come across some men that their whole channel is just nothing about just sowing division, calling out this person, calling out that person, calling out that person. They like to see people fight. They get people riled up and fight, and then they step back and watch the comment section, and everyone's just fighting. They're swift to run to cause mischief. They're causing problems. And anything, that'd be like, that's the instigator right there. Now, it doesn't say instigator, so please, I'm not saying thus say the Lord instigator. I'm saying, when we're talking about instigating, feet that be swift and running to mischief. You're just trying to cause trouble. Remember the definition. Is that back here? How far back was that? Here. That which moves persons to commit wickedness. That that incites. Verse 19. A false witness that speaketh lies. I've had that done on me. 
And I know brethren in ministry that have, it, have had it done where people lie about you. And the last one says, And he that soweth discord among the brethren. The number one goal of an instigator is to sow discords among the brethren. Million would qualify for most of these in this case, and I believe got Aaron to qualify. But like I said, the, the sh shedding blood, innocent blood, no. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, it's just that wasn't there either. But a lot of these were. Was a proud look. They started elevating themselves, thinking that they're more important. A lying tongue, you know. God said, this is what I have for you. And they're like, no, no, we can be equal to Moses. We can be equal. And they start get, started getting on to him. But brothers says Christ, all seven of those is an abomination. But that seventh one we're hidden, sowing discord among the brethren. That's what instigators like to do. Their whole intent is to, there's two intents. One is to wreck your walk with the Lord, get you off the right path. And two, to sow discord among the brethren. Get everyone fighting and everything. Arguing, debating, fighting. Remember Paul said, lest I come and find you arguing and debating. We're not supposed to be debating. There is nothing in the Bible here that we can agree to disagree on. That's a false satanic teaching. Paul says we're to be of the same mind and of the same judgment, striving together. All right. When we say, thus saith the Lord, we're all supposed to be on the same page. There is nothing we can agree to disagree on when it comes to the Word of God. Now, if you want to talk about whose favorite color, what's the best color in the world, or best fruit in the world, that... We can agree, agree to disagree on that stuff, but that has nothing to do with the Word of God itself. When we say, thus saith the Lord, we're supposed to be on the same page. You say, what about people you believe are saved and fall away? Like these instigators, because I said sometimes brethren can instigate, and fall, but mainly false converts. But you have brethren that are falling, getting worked up by false converts. 2 Corinthians 5, 13, 5, we said this before, Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know your own selves, how Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Make sure they prove themselves first. Now, they've proven themselves to be in a standing position. There's a changed life. They're gun, they're, 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 they have such a love of the Word of God. They're trying to live it and everything. And then they start falling away. That's someone who's fallen away. When there's no changed life, you're not dealing with someone who's a fallen, a false, uh, you're dealing with a false convert. You're not dealing with someone who's fallen away. Someone who's saved that's fallen away. Acts, 29, Acts chapter 20, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch. There it is again. Oh, being sober and being vigilant for your adversary, they'll go out. That means we have to look for the time of Jacob's trouble. No, it doesn't. Therefore, watch. You're supposed to watch for these things. You're supposed to watch out for men that, of your own selves when men arise speaking perverse things. You're supposed to watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing. You're supposed to keep an eye out for these instigators. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everybody night and day with tears. Paul could see how messed up, he set, the, he set people on the right path, and he saw how pe much people were coming in and messing his work up that he did for the Lord. He showed you the truth, he showed you the right way of doing things, the true plan of salvation, the right way of doing things, and people come in and mess everyone up. And he ceased not to warn you night and day with tears. But of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So what do we do when, of our own selves when people start losing their way? You correct them first. Then the sin rebuke before all. A man that's a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Admonition. You go to them to reprove them, correct them in your heartfelt desire and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If preventure they would recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have taken captain by him at his will. Our heartfelt desire when you go to correct someone is to see them get back up in a standing position. You don't run behind a camera and start calling that person out just to, like you're trying to destroy that person. And you want to see that person just be utterly destroyed. No, that's the wrong way to correct someone. You correct them with the heartfelt desire to see them get back up in a stand position. Now, by all means, you call out and you rebuke false converts and wolves in sheep's clothing. Absolutely. But when it comes to correcting a brother in Christ, right, 
you correct them. Now, they, they won't get corrected. They won't listen. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division, offenses contrary to the doctrines which ye have learned. No, it doesn't say false comfort. It doesn't say saved or lost. It says both. It doesn't matter. Either way, if you believe they're lost or if you believe they're saved. If they're causing divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines which ye have heard. Because I've had brethren ask me, well, they, they teach a lot of good things, but they don't teach the true plan of salvation. Stay away from them. Oh, they, they say they believe the King James Bible is God's perfect written word, but boy, they really do correct it a lot, and they go outside the Bible a lot, like to the Apocrypha books. Stay away from them. If they're correcting this book and adding to this book and subtracting from this book, stay away from them. They're not King James Bible believers. Contrary to the doctrines which you have learned, and avoid them. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You say, well, verse 18 says, For they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. But this is Christ. There's times where I backslid, and I started serving the flesh. And I wasn't serving Jesus as a saved sinner. But honestly, 18, For they such to serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That's where we get the good words and fair speeches. This verse, I brought it up because there's some that, like I said, they get to the point where they become question marks. I don't know if they're saved or not. But the Bible says, mark them and avoid them. Period. Period. Because at that point, they're not serving our Lord Jesus Christ. They could be, they could be a false convert. But their own bellies, and by good words and fair species, deceiving the hearts of the simple, or they can be led astray. 2 Thessalonians 3 6 says, Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly. So even if you take Romans 16 17 that says, Okay, that's just lost people, and you're trying to talk about saved people, okay, that's lost people. 2 Thessalonians 3 6 says, Now we have commanded you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves. From every brother that walketh disorderly. Mark them. Romans 16, 17. Avoid them. And not after the traditions which you have received of us. Not the world. Paul, be followers of me as I am of Christ. 1 Timothy 5, 20. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Like I said, try to correct them. Try to get them back on the right path. Ties 3 10 is where we get a man that is a heretic after the first and second ad admonition reject, knowing that he is, that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. By all means, try to correct them, but when you realize you see these instigators, stay away from them. Don't listen to them. And I've said this before, regardless whether you believe they're saved or lost, 1 Timothy 6 3. 1 Timothy 6 3. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus, and the doctrines which is according to godliness, the doctrines there that are according to godliness, is the doctrines that God has revealed through Paul, the, the apostle to the Gentiles. And we are supposed to go back and learn from Jesus, the words of Jesus Christ. And sometimes Jesus did talk about this time period, but Paul reiterates it, because Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. People say, you're just a Pauline, you're just a Pauline. No, I just know that a lot of people are getting messed up in the Gospels. They're grabbing things that are not for the time of the Gentiles. They're not for today. Enduring to the end, and then you shall be saved, like Matthew 24, Mark, I want to say 13 or 15, and then Luke 21, I think it is. I get them mixed up sometimes. But the Sermon on the Mount... Talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, people will grab that and apply it to today. Why? Because they're the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to the doctrines which are according to godliness. Yes, we're supposed to listen to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we're also supposed to follow 2 Timothy 2.15. Verse 4, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about strife, questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife. These instigators, they cause strife. These instigators, you realize they're really proud, these instigators. Strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. From such, withdraw thyself.
Now, you can conform or you can withdraw yourself. That's what we're seeing here with Aaron. We're going to get back to Aaron. I know it's a big, long time. We're going to get back to Aaron and Mary, but you can conform or withdraw yourself. Okay? Once again, Romans 12.2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When you fail to start doing that, it's when you start conforming. When you start putting this to the side, and you're listening to whoever's whispering in your ear that's getting you to put the flesh first, the world first, or maybe even getting you so far off course that you're starting to do things Satan's way. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're to conform to Jesus Christ. We're to conform to this book. Jesus said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Jesus set the example, and then he appointed Paul, and Paul set the example. Once again, Miriam is falling for the age-old lie that was given to Eve. Yea, hath God said, you can be as gods. And I believe Aaron is following a bad example. I do. But he's just as guilty. He's 100% guilty. Let's get back to the story of Aaron and Miriam and show why I believe that. Okay? We're doing a recap. Remember 12, Numbers 12, 1, it said, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married. They tried to use one excuse to hide their real agenda. The real agenda had nothing to do with that Ethiopian woman. It had to do with they wanted to be equal to, Aaron, uh, to Moses. They basically wanted Moses' job. For he had married an Ethiopian woman, and they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And here's the thing. We're getting caught up on. And the Lord heard it. Numbers 12.3 Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He was. And just a quick reminder to the brethren. You'll have to turn here. 2 Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Be careful of ministries where they're just yelling at the camera left and right. Or they seem to have a lot of bitterness and hate towards the world, towards the brethren. Be careful of those men. Okay? A servant of the Lord must not strive. You preach the truth, the truth will divide. God will divide and show who's his and who isn't. You just preach the truth and you look at people's actions and you judge their actions. Their fruit. Their works. Okay? But we're to be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. Patient. I need help on that one. Patient. 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. We want them to repent and get back on the right path. If you come out as an adversary, if you come out just hardcore yelling at them, they'll put up a shield and you'll lose your opportunity to reach them for the truth. That's why it says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Be gentle unto all men, not strive. All right? Because that's how you reach people for the truth. You don't reach people for the truth when you're yelling at them and you're showing bitterness and hate towards them. You're, put, you're pushing them off from the truth. You're hardening their heart towards the truth. Verse 26, and they, That they may recover themselves out of the stare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Okay. Be wary of in Instigators sowing division among men in the ministry that love the word of God and love the brethren. Be careful about that. Some can fake the meekness behind a camera till they are backed into a corner. I've seen that too. Some people can put on a show in front of the camera, be meek. But when you back them into a corner, you're attacking their lowercase g gods, their idolatry, their covetousness, their worldliness. And that meekness, that humbleness, disappears in a heartbeat. Then the real self comes out <laughs> in my notes. Moses is backed into a corner, and guess what? There's many times where Moses is backed into a corner, especially with that 250. When the 250 men came out, he bowed himself before them. He humbled himself. They were 100% in the wrong. Those three men that got those 250 Levites to turn on Aaron and turn on Moses, they were 100% in the wrong. But Moses remained humble. He remained meek. 
Those preachers are very hard to find. Now, I'm not saying I'm one of those. I'm still working on it. But they're hard to find. Not, not, I'm not talking about preachers that are pushovers, that just glad to have you here, and they're all about love. And, and they, I'm not talking about those preachers. I'm talking about ones that don't lose their temper in a heartbeat, like some men have on, online. They don't lose their temper in a heartbeat. They remain meek. It's all about loving their brother says Christ, wanting to see him get back up on their feet. Moses is backed into a corner and remains meek, humble, gentle. And he does it all through the Bible. You read, they turn on him so many times. And he finally, we talked about this, acknowledge him in all thy ways, Moses, where he finally lost his temper. And he struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. He lost his temper. But boy, did it take a lot. If you look at everything that was happening to Moses, it took a lot for that man to lose his temper. He was angry with the cause, and he, he held on to that anger, and he lashed out with that anger, and he failed the Lord. Moses was very meek above all the men which, back to Numbers chapter 12. Moses was meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Numbers 12, 4. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. They bring before everybody. And they three came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of the cloud, and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in dreams. You have Daniel. This is good. Daniel's a good example. Okay. He, you, talk, you read Daniel, he had to... Interpret the two dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. He also had a lot of dreams while he was uh, taken captive in Babylon. Right. Verse 7. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth. And even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall be held. Brothers says Christ, when I read this, with him will I speak mouth to mouth. It made me think of Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. Can you believe that God was talking to people face to face? Was it hidden in dreams and visions? Remember, uh, uh, John had a vision. He was in the spirit. He had a vision, revelation. You have Peter that he had a vision. And he saw the cloth come down with all the animals on it. And God was trying to teach him that now what was unclean is now clean. Okay. They had visions. But this same John and, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, John and Peter, when Jesus was in his earthly ministry, it was God the Father. It was God manifest in the flesh. God was speaking to him. Pardon me. Moses was like that. Lord, Brethren, I pray to the Lord all the time and say, Lord, I long for that day to see you face to face, to talk with you face to face. I've never heard the voice of the Lord. People always say, you can hear, no, the Holy Spirit comes in, he opens the scriptures to us, but we've never heard the voice of the Lord the way Moses has. We've never heard the voice of the Lord the way John and Peter and the apostles and the people that were there when he was preaching to them. But someday we will. Someday we will. God will still speak to us by the Holy Spirit through His Word and correct us through brethren that use His Word to correct us and get us back on the right path. But that really got in my heart because I'm going through John and Jesus' is preaching. I was like, that's God talking to him. Just like He did Moses. He talked to Moses face to face. I'm sorry, mouth to mouth. Not face to face. At all. Mouth to mouth. But Moses did see the back of Jesus. I believe it was Jesus that he saw the back of. But anyway... Wherefore, when, when were ye not afraid to speak against the serf, my servant Moses? You know what happens? You know what usually comes hand in hand with someone who gets prideful and starts, you know, self-worth and starts thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to think? You know the next thing that's usually short to go, to, to disappear? The fear of the Lord. Where's the fear? Pride gets in the way of you fearing the Lord, brother, says Christ. Self-worth, when you start elevating yourself to be worth so much, you, start, you stop fearing the Lord. 
your, your vanity, your ego. And I've seen that with men in ministry. Their egos get the better of them. Their pride, and they stop fearing the Lord. They start handling the Word of God wrong. They start handling the brethren wrong. Treating the brethren the wrong way. Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And here it is. This is why I believe Miriam was the instigator. We read those stories. God really goes after the instigators. That's the first person he gets. And then he'll go after the others. Okay, but he's always going after the instigators really good. It says, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Wait a minute, what about Aaron? Aaron's, I believe he's 100% just as guilty. I do, 100%. But what happened to Aaron being leprous and white as snow? It was just Miriam. Now what's Aaron's response when he sees Miriam that's leprous as white as snow? And Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold, she was leprous. I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Exodus 32, 32 says, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sins, and if, thou, if not blot me, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. This is Moses. He's up there. They've sinned against him. He says, Forgive their sins, and if not blot me, I pray out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whomsoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. I have mercy on who I will have mercy, and forgiveness on who I will have forgiveness. Exodus 32, 19, that's this verse. And he said, I will make all, Exodus, I need to slow down. Exodus 33, 19. It's just, we've been here for a while. <laughs> Forgive me, brother, sister. Still don't know how Paul could preach all night. <laughs> uh, but with the Holy Spirit and with God, all things are possible. Exodus 33, 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious, there is gracious to whom I am gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. I had it wrong. Forgive me, brothers of Christ. Gracious on whom I am gracious, and mercy on whom I am mercy. In Romans chapter 9, verse 15, we read, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You say, why is that important? Remember, Miriam became leprous and white as snow. I believe God looked at Aaron and said, hey, Aaron, once again, you got, you got led astray. He'll have compassion on whom you have compassion and mercy on whom you have mercy. He still showed mercy to Miriam because he could have killed Miriam right on the spot. He didn't. That was still mercy. Romans 9.18 says, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardened, hardeneth. Now, Miriam gets leprous white as snow as a punishment. What happens to Aaron? Only Miriam was punished. We're going to find out. God will go after the instigator, I believe, when you look at the experience, scripture with scripture, and you look at all the different stories, when an instigator is involved, God will go right after that instigator. God will go after the instigators like Peter, first, then, like Peter, first, then deal with the ones that fell for the investigator. Okay, remember he, he looked at the, the uh, disciples and then he rebuked Peter. This is Jesus, the story we talked about Jesus. Then he went and did a story teaching them not to make the same mistake Peter did. Okay, Paul did the same thing when he, he went after Peter. So when he rebuked Peter, everyone saw it so they could start getting their heart right. And when Peter got his heart right, since he was the instigator as a saved man, he turned around and said, I did this wrong. This is the right way to do it. He, got, he started helping, I believe, Paul. Peter started helping Paul get everyone back to being straight, get, doing what was right. Let's see why Aaron was not punished in like manner. This is why I believe. Numbers 12, back to Numbers 12, verse 11. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. You see this about Aaron. He, he fails the Lord. He realized, I got bamboozled. 
I got deceived. I got talked into doing something I shouldn't have done. I shouldn't have made that. Remember we talked about he shouldn't have made the golden calf? So what does he do? He tries to distract people from the golden calf and says, we're going to do an altar here. We're going to do sacrifices unto the Lord over here, away from the calf. But it was too late. And when he was called out, he humbles himself. Aaron humbled himself. God knew Aaron's heart, and God knew Miriam's heart. Wherein we have sinned, let her not be as one dead, whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. That fear of God came back like that with Aaron. And he falls down, we have sinned. We have done foolishly. Remember 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. And Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. Psalms 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. God knew Aaron's heart. Numbers 12, 13, and Moses cried unto the Lord and said, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Now wait a minute. I stopped here when I was doing this and said, wait a minute. What about Miriam? She's leprous. You can still talk. Don't you remember the story of the, the lepers and that, are, that go out? I don't want to mess up the story, but they're at, is, uh, Jerusalem is surrounded, and they're running out of food and everything, and you have the three lepers there, and they talk among themselves, and, and God makes the army that's out there hear a noise, and they all flee, and they go, but they're talking. Miriam can still talk. She's not been silenced from talking. She can still talk with leprosy. There's people that talk with leprosy. Where is she humbling herself? Where is she doing what Aaron did, where she falls on her knees and says, Lord, where I was wrong in what I did. I acted foolishly. I don't believe she had the same heart as Aaron. I believe she was the instigator. I do. You can, you can disagree with me, but one thing you need to agree, they both rebelled against God. Okay. So I believe God humbled her. Let's keep reading how he humbled her. Numbers 12, 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that, she, and after that let her be received again. In other words, God spit at her, gave her leprosy. That's, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out and received in again. Verse 15, And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. God had to humble her. God had to really humble her. Now, if you can disagree with me all you want, but for this teaching, brothers and Christ, I hope you get the point of the teaching. There are instigators out there that will instigate, and they'll sit back and watch everyone fall apart. The, the brethren, the children of the Lord, the body of Christ, and that's their whole point. We need to make people prove themselves, and we need to be careful that we don't let instigators whisper in our ear and tickle our ear, and that we're not looking for teachers that have itching ears, you know. Brethren, do not let good words and fair speeches turn you from the truth of God's Word. Trusting God with all your heart and acknowledging Him in all thy ways. Acknowledge Him. Lord, am I doing it the right way? Am I doing it your way? Be content with what you have. Brothers and Christ, that's a big thing. Be content with what you have. Whether it's in ministry, or the world in itself. Or what God has for you in your life with the Lord and living for Him. Be content with what you have. Do not fall for instigators that are here to wreck your walk with the Lord and sow division and discord in the body of Christ. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Acts 17, 10 we read, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming to thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. These were more noble than those at Thessalonica. 
and that they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily whether those things are so. Brothers Christ, the more you spend in this, the less these instigators are going to get you messed up. But if you don't know this, with good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts of the simple. Simple are people who don't know this. I was talking to a brother in Christ and I was talking about Ecclesiastes and I said, I, for some reason the word Ecclesiastes, sometimes I have words that just disappear and I have the hardest time finding those words again. They just, that's, I have a seizure disorder and I, I think it's part of the seizure disorder, but words will just disappear. Titles, words, and I'm like, Lord, I need help, Lord, I need help, and the Lord helps me. But I was talking to him and I couldn't think Ecclesiastes and I asked him, I said, uh, you know, the book that's called The Preacher. And he's like, there's a book called The Preacher? Brother, you're not in this book enough. <laughs> yes, there's a book called The Preacher. He's not newly saved either. If he's newly saved, have some grace. They need to get into this book. But someone who's been saved for years and years and years and years, and you didn't know there was a book called The Preacher? You need to get back in this book, brother, says Christ. You need to get back into the book. You need to make sure that you're spending all most of your free time in this book, listening to Alexander Scorby. Read the Bible, listen to good Bible preaching, spend some time to sit there and read and go verse by verse and stop and talk to the Lord about every verse you're reading and talk with the Lord. You need to spend a lot of your free time in this book, Brother Says Christ, especially in these last days. Well, I want to spend my free time having fun. Flesh is fun, fun is flesh. No, you need to make some sacrifices. Fellowship with the brethren, talk about the Word of God with brethren. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same things. Instigators will always try to bring in so division. They don't want you speaking the same things. And that there be no division among you. That's my desire, brothers of Christ. I just preach the truth, and I'm trying to get you to the truth. I don't want division among the body of Christ, but in these last days, this isn't the priority to the brethren. They're getting distracted by the flesh, by the world, by Satan, by ministers that are brethren that in ministry that are falling away, by instigators. I don't want any division among you. Paul didn't want any division among the brethren. How do we not have division? This is the final authority. We're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. But that you be perfectly joined together. In the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chol, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. A lot, there's a lot of instigators that are behind Babel, uh, that stand up behind the pulpits, that stand behind the camera on YouTube. 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or are you baptized in the name of Paul? Brothers says Christ, stay away from instigators. And try, stay in this book, and work hard not to become an instigator yourself. When someone comes to correct you, or to take some time with you to go through the scriptures, to say, hey, you're wrong here, or you're wrong there, take time to go with them. I've gone with, through the scripture with brethren where I still lined up with the Bible, and they didn't. I've gone through the scriptures with brethren where they lined up with the Bible and I didn't. And I got corrected, so now I line up with the Bible. Okay. But we all need to be on the same page and the same judgment. We all need to be striving together. And when you have an instigator, stay away from them. I can't warn enough. Paul warned night and day with tears. Stay away from the instigators and don't become an instigator. Don't let pride and ego... And vanity get the better of you, brothers of Christ. Now he said, why did you read uh, about, I'm of Paul and I'm of Cephas? Well, this is going to lead into acknowledging him in all thy ways, Aaron, part three. The mentor mentality, being a respecter of persons. Sometimes there's people that Satan will raise up that seem that, like, like they look like they're King James Bible believers. And they talk like they're King James Bible believers, but they're instigators. Okay. And they'll get you off on the wrong path real quick. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, hope this has helped. It's been a long study. Hope this has helped. Good Bible study, good in exhortation. Don't become an instigator.
This word of God comes first. Not this body of flesh. Don't get proud. Don't get prideful. Okay? Don't become an instigator. Don't fall for instigators. And we're going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next study.